What's up, everybody? Thanks for being patient. Took a couple of weeks off, traveled for the holidays, had some holidays, got sick, uh, got better, got sick again. I'm better. Got some cases. Some of you may be new. I see a lot of names that are familiar, which is great. For those of you that are new, um, or for those of you that want to review the opacities, we're going to talk about them. Gas, fat, soft tissue, fluid, mineral, uh, bone, and metal. So you don't have to remember those necessarily. They're all present in each radiograph. Um, I'll talk a lot about differential attenuation of the x-ray beam. So coming out of the x-ray tube, photons fire out. They sort of uh, smash into the patient. They collect them in the detector. And then depending on several factors like the thickness of the patient uh, or the thickness of, of the tissue, uh, the, the atomic number and the um, energy of the photon, the tissue density, those factors will interact to give you the different shades of gray that you'll see on, on the detector. Um, and so it's important to, uh, to know these. Uh, Rentgen signs, we talk about these size, shape, number, location, opacity, and margin. Uh, so it's good to use those um, because there will be diseases that you don't know. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to get heart failure, you're going to get pneumonia, you're going to feel really good about that, and maybe just jump straight to the diagnosis. But I think it's important to go over these Rentgen signs on pathology um, because there will be time and again cases where you don't know what's going on. And when you use these Rentgen signs, if you take a step back and, and you know, even write these down, take a step back, it'll help you uh, refine your differential diagnoses. First case, coughing dog. It's like a six-year-old Basenji that's coughing, okay? We got three views. I'm going to give you some time to look at it. You're going to tell me uh, what you think is wrong. I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong. And then we're going to answer questions and we're going to learn. And then we're going to go to happy hour afterwards. All right, here we go. You got three views. Here's a right lateral view, left lateral view, and a VD view. Okay, I always like to just kind of start coughing. All right, anybody got anything? What do you think? Anybody have any abnormalities? I'm going to tell you pulmonary venous congestion. Okay. First thing I do is, uh, you know, we talked about positioning and all that. We don't need to go into great detail there. You know, this is too much up here. Uh, the thoracic limbs are kind of pulled forward, blah, blah, blah. These are pulled forward. This is pretty good. You know, most most docs, you're not helping. You're not sedating these dogs. You're giving you text. Not a lot to work with. This is a pretty straight radiograph. You see these spinous processes right here, right on midline. Right here, those like teardrops, pretty straight radiograph. OK, so this I would describe as a broadly based Within the cervical trachea, there's a broadly based soft tissue opacity that attenuates over 75% of the lumen, and the degree of narrowing differs between lateral views. Uh, you quickly look over here to the principal bronchi crina area looking for collapse, and, and I don't have it. Uh, the patient is obese. The cranial abdomen is normal. The cranial mediastinum is within normal limits. I look at the pleural space right here. Um, I look for thoracic lymphadenopathy right here. You'll see ill-defined soft tissue. It smashes into the crina. You'll see ill-defined soft tissue, dorsal convexity. It's, uh, the second sternum bra will be the sternal lymph nodes. Sometimes the cranial mediastinal nodes can be hard, but you'll see them uh, as poorly defined soft tissue here, which will give you a corresponding thickening on that VD view. Um, the cardiac silhouette for me is a bit difficult in this case because you have on the clock face analogy on the VD view, the two to three o'clock position is your left auricle and you get that left auricular bulge. Um, and I, you know, I've been fooled by what I would consider either differences in phase of respiration in the cardiac cycle. Because of this is a single point in time radiograph, I feel like I've seen cases that left oracle kind of bumps out, um, but that's more anecdotal. So I feel like in this case, you you could sort of say, hey, I wonder if this animal has a, um, a heart murmur. This though, this is the rib. So don't be fooled by this. This is the rib. So the cardiac silhouette, it kind of comes up like this and then it it has a sort of a flamboyant waist where the pulmonary veins enter the left atrium. Uh, this, I don't know, man. So I think this is a case where you've got this dorsal tracheal opacification, and then maybe, maybe you can talk about some left auricular bulge and you're talking about mitral valve disease sort of at most. But the reason I wanted to bring this up is because at one point there was a, a confusion um, or, or just questions related to the tracheal collapse and when you can call it tracheal collapse because conventionally we're taught that you can't say that the dog has tracheal collapse or to me, if you use the word tracheal collapse, I think you're implying that there's maybe a, a chondromalacia. So I think one of the things I just wanted to put to you is that the term that I will sometimes use, if I think it's tracheal collapse, like it's your, you know, your brachycephalic dog and this thing is smashed, 
shut. You can say, you know, tracheal collapse, and then you say it's probably from chondromalacia. What, what could be less specific, but potentially more helpful ultimately is to use the terminology dorsal tracheal opacification. And so that dorsal tracheal opacification right here, its presence is dependent upon several factors. One could be the breed. So if you've got a large breed dog and they're not predisposed to tracheal collapse, this probably isn't chondromalacia. So if you call it tracheal collapse and somebody gets older of that report, they're gonna freak out a little bit. So that's why you can say dorsal tracheal opacification. I've seen cases where you got brachycephalic airway dogs and they're breathing against the closed sort of nares and glottis, and that negative intrathoracic pressure will cause that membrane to dip in a little bit more than maybe it would otherwise. And so now you're playing the game of has it dipped in too much? And I, I think that's where you maybe have to be a little bit careful. And so this one is 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 pretty invaginated. I mean, that kind of goes down pretty, pretty deeply. Um, the other thing that you'll get, and we'll see it on CT, is the esophagus. It'll sit over it, and the esophagus will pooch into that membrane a little bit. And so then you'll have the esophagus riding in that groove of that normally somewhat elastic dorsal membrane. And so when you get that in there, it'll it'll create that opacification that you can't discern on, on radiographs very well. Um, the other thing that can cause, the other thing that you can just kind of throw out there in the exam room to look like you, you kind of know what's going on is tracheitis, inhaled irritants, infectious tracheobronchitis. But I feel like that's more, it's more uniform. It's not like, it's not this sort of focal dorsal, uh, you know, ventrally convex opacity. Sometimes we see redundant tracheal membrane. What does that mean? So that tends to be the term. There was a paper, I think based out of Davis that said, you know, and, and, that, and the terminology is confusing. Um, but to me, when somebody says there's a redundant dorsal uh, or a redundant tracheal membrane, to me, that means that they're implying that that membrane is pathologically invaginated in and that there's a it's it's a real worry that the dog has chondromalacia. So I think that's why you should say. Um, and, and it's just, you know, to me, I think the take home point is be careful with the terminology. I don't use megasophagus. I, I don't really say megasophagus unless they're, they're telling me the dog has like diagnosed functional motility disorder of the esophagus. I'll say that there's a gas-filled esophagus, and then you can talk about all the things, but as soon as you say megasophagus in a radiograph report, it's game on. People use that terminology. It means something to them, and it usually means, uh, you know, aspiration pneumonia and a motility disorder and just these Bailey chairs and the whole bit. So I won't say this is tracheal collapse. I'll say this is a dorsal tracheal pacification, and then if it's a breed that we think has chondromalacia, or you're worried that it has chondromalacia, then you can say that this could represent, this dorsal tracheal opacification could represent a redundant tracheal membrane from tracheal collapse from chondromalacia. Do you see how it's just muddy? I, you could just say there's a dorsal tracheal pacification, and then you could drop a semicolon or whatever and say, look, I, I think that this could be chondromalacia because of these reasons, breed, um, degree of collapse. So. The degree of collapse, I think there was this weak positive correlation with the degree of collapse on the radiograph and chondromalacia. So again, it's a game of if it comes down pretty far and kind of looks like it's it's collapsed and smashed, I think you can sort of go, look, man, I, I really think that this is a chondromalacia because that's what we're really worried about. Is it chondromalacia um, in a lot of these patients? Other things, you'll get mural hemorrhage, coagulopathies. They can bleed into that mural. I mean, but that's rare as hen's teeth. Um, inhaled foreign bodies I've seen, but usual suspects are, is this a problem or is it not? Is it chondromalacia or is it not? If it's a large breed dog, it probably isn't. But I have seen laryngeal paralysis, right? And then they try to breathe and that'll drop the membrane. And then it looks like this. And then you go, oh, it's coughing because of the trachea. But no, the it's just an indirect indicator that you need to look further upstream. So I, I think dorsal tracheal pacification, and then you go, you know what, this is a large breed dog. It could be laryngeal paralysis if that fits. It could be the, the esophagus dumping in, in which case it's no big deal. Sometimes the, the membrane will just invaginate a little bit, and, and that's normal as well. Can LARPAR be seen radiographically? I get excited about LARPAR in a radiograph. If I read the signalment, old large breed dog that's you know talking about strider obviously you kind of get excited but if i see this dorsal tracheal membrane that's dipped in pretty pretty um it's a pretty robust dip maybe i see some esophageal gas whether that's from uh you know the geriatric onset and you'll get like the neuro 
muscular issues that affect the esophagus as well. So you sort of get a, a neurodegenerative disorder of the esophagus. Um, you know, so the trifecta would be the esophagus is dilated, you got aspiration pneumonia, and then you've got a tracheal membrane that's dipped in. And then you ask if the dog has strider. So I don't know if that answers your, your question. Was the right, was there osteoarthrosis in the right elbow joint on the VD view? No, not that I see. And I don't see it on these views. I think you're okay. 21 minutes and we've done one case. That is what I would consider a really hard fail on my part. Okay, so let's do this. Let's do this one. Three radiographs, no history. I want you guys to tell me the history. No history. You tell me the history. You got it. You got a minute. Here we go. Left lateral view, right lateral view. I'll shut up. Okay, now I'm going to tell you, this is a this is a uh, six-year-old French bulldog that's got some upper airway obstructed breathing. Got flu we got a vote for fluid in the caudal esophagus, okay? So Steve has said, Steve's done a couple of things. He's located, he's dropped the location as the caudal esophagus. So he's, he's confident, he's saying esophagus. He's not saying caudal thorax. He's not saying caudal mediastinum. He's going, it's in the esophagus. So you see those levels, you can go, I mean, on this case, you could go, there's something in the chest that's a problem right? Like that's the first step. And then where is it in the chest? It's in the caudal and dorsal chest. Okay, cool. And then where is it in the caudal dorsal chest? Boom. It's a bit midline slightly to the right. Okay. Now I'm going, what's back there? Okay. Mediastinum. Well, what's in the mediastinum? Okay. You got esophagus, right? So Steve's going, boom, esophagus. I know it's esophagus. And if you feel confident that you've seen things like this before, it's, and then, you know, but what else is here? You got an accessory lung lobe, you got the diaphragm, um, there's blood vessels, and then there's the cava right there. So, and then the aorta's up here, the azygous veins up there. So, blood vessels probably a little. Yeah. So there's a there's a soft tissue opacity in the area of a hernia. So the way that you can do this is you can say, on the right lateral view, comma in the caudal dorsal thorax, there is a soft tissue opaque mass. That's a mass. You describe that as a mass, right? Anything bigger than three centimeter, on a on a uh, Okay, so there's a soft tissue opaque mass in the caudal dorsal thorax. And this is where it gets fun because the mass is sort of midline to the right of midline. You can go ahead and, I mean, let's not be coy. It's in the area of the lower esophageal sphincter. It's in the area, of, sorry, of the caudal esophagus. What's interesting is you can see on this one, part of the Rentgen sign is the margin. So what's interesting is the cranial border, most of it is pretty discernible. So you can say it's cranially convex and it's fairly discreet. The caudal border is indistinct. I, I don't see where that ends. And the reason is, is because differential attenuation, which we talked about first. And so this is something that's fluid or soft tissue and it's surrounded at least in part by gas. The caudal part is not surrounded by gas and that's why you can't see it. So mediastinal structures tend to be, they can be partially surrounded by gas when they kind of bump into the, the surrounding lung. The other thing that's telling is that it kind of goes away on the left lateral view. I mean, I can hallucinate that there's something here, but it's certainly not looking like that. So now you've got this dynamic structure and, and you know, I don't know about you, but pulmonary tumors, esophageal tumors like spirocerca and, and uh, you know, sarcomas and stuff like that, um, they, don't, they don't change, okay? So now you've got a sliding hiatal hernia and because of the uh, incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter, these dogs tend to be, um, they can be clinical, they can regurgitate. Differential diagnosis would be, in this case, it was from just, he can't breathe, right? He can't walk, he can't breathe. And so it's just pulling that up. And so he's got this sliding hiatal hernia. If you're completely on an island and you're alone and you've panicked and you're freaking out and you're talking tumors and you're ruining owner's day, what you can do is drop a little bit of barium paste. You put the animal on the table, you get a dime size, quarter size dollop, throw it on the roof of their mouth, and boom, lateral view and a VD or a DV view almost right away. And, and that can help you confirm some things like its origin. Oh, this thing kind of is in the stomach. It outlined this rugal fold or, or whatever. So um, that can kind of help you as well. How would I describe the spine as a mess? I would describe the spine as completely normal for this dog. So here's how I would describe the spine. Where did that go? Is this it? Yeah. So I, I would describe this spine, right? If they give me the history, 
I'm hoping they don't give me the history of a T3 L3 myelopathy. If they don't give me a history that relates to the spine, then I would sort of blow this off. And I would say that the uh, there are numerous thoracic vertebral body anomalies characteristic of the breed. The vertebral body anomalies uh, contribute to a caudal thoracic kyphosis and scoliosis. And then you could talk about spondylosis deformans in here. But to go on about the disc spaces and da 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 da, da uh, you know, that's not that's not helpful. What could be helpful is if you say that the last ribs are symmetric, because this dog may have, at some point in his life have have surgery, and that can just be something that's useful to document, but not necessary. So I would describe it as numerous thoracic vertebral body anomalies characteristic of the breed, contributing to a caudal thoracic kyphosis and scoliosis. Three radiographs. We've got a left lateral view, a right lateral view, and a VD view. Okay, I'll give you a couple minutes. Remember, Jerry, uh, six-year-old golden coughing. Okay, anybody have anything? Okay, so what we do in in um, this particular case is we go this. This is what we're going to do, right? We say he's he's obese, he's fat, right? Obese, I guess we shouldn't fat shame. He's obese. Got a large body habitus. This is a right lateral view because the diaphragm, the crew are parallel, right? He's rotated. See these ribs? They're they're pretty rotated. So the dog is kind of rolling. Um, the cardiac silhouette is normal, right? There's no left atrial enlargement. There's no widening. This thoracic trachea doesn't look like it's deviated dorsally. Okay, the trachea is normal. The pleural space is normal. Thoracic lymphadenopathy is absent, right? Well, you may go, well, okay, hold on. There's something here, but his limbs are pulled for uh, pulled caudally. And then you look on the VD view, and you're going to look right in here for the cranial mediastinum, and it's not wide. And even if it was wide, you could argue that it's fat, um, but it's not. Then I kind of look at the pleural space right here. Boom, 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 like that. Okay. Um, it's got some air in the stomach. This is this last right rib has lumberization, a little bit of a transitional vertebra. So when you're looking at the lung, okay, you want to look over the, the 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 cardiac silhouette of the heart, and uh, yeah, maybe increased opacity over the caudal middle area, maybe style area on the VD, and over the heart on the lateral. Okay. So when you look over the, uh, let's see if I can split this thing. Okay, so the right lateral view is normal. This is normal and this view is abnormal. Okay, so when you look over the cardiac silhouette, you'll if you see anything that's opaque like this, it better be a rib or a blood vessel, right? That's how I was trained. You wanna look over the cardiac silhouette. So rib, 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 rib. Blood vessels are kind of hard to see, but they're here. Okay, so when you go over here, you go rib, 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 rib. What's all this shit? Right, and then you can kind of zoom out a little bit and you go, whoa, there's something right here. That area should look like this area. And it's just more opaque. And then you zoom in and you go, oh, that's an air bronchogram. And I don't care that you can't really see it on the VD view. I've been burned so many times by going, I can't see it. I can't see it. I can't see it. I mean, it's real. It's there. It's hiding. It's probably hiding under here. So, all right, so we got a lung pattern. Now what do we do with the lung pattern? Because I, I think this is the distribution for me is, is so key in my in the algorithm in my head in, in terms of differentiating stuff. So I drop a line through the cardiac silhouette and I say, okay, once you found the nugget, you guys, is it worse in the cranial ventral or is it in the caudal dorsal? And if it's in the craniovental, the first three differentials are pneumonia. Maybe fourth is hemorrhage. Maybe fifth is a migrating foreign body. If you're vacationing in Santa Barbara, those are real and they are nasty. Um, caudal dorsal, it's cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Pulmonary edema and just plain probability, you're most likely dealing with the cardiogenic. Okay, so this is a cranial and ventral distributed alveolar pattern. And so the way you would describe this is I like to start with the anatomy because if you read the report, for me, the anatomy, it takes you right away. Instead of saying there's this opacity and it's got this margin and blah, 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 and it's in the chest. You know, you say the in the area or in the right middle lung lobe, there's increased soft tissue opacity that completely obscures pulmonary blood vessels and yields discrete air bronchograms. Done. The dog is obese. And then you conclude right middle lung pneumonia. And then you just let the person that requested the service decide, do they think it's aspiration or infectious? Because there's a lot of times where we don't get that, that information. 
So just because of its right middle location and the ventral distribution, it can still be an infectious etiology. Um, I think there was a report, you know, I'm sure there was four dogs or six dogs in it, but uh, canine influenza, it still had a, a ventral distribution in some cases. So, okay. So Doc Steve has, has picked up on this. And I, I think that, that he's saying that there's a border effacement, love of term, oh, so good, of the caudal ventral margins of the heart or the cardiac silhouette and the caudal vena cava. And I don't know if he's talking about this, okay? But this is this is great that he's he's maybe brought this up. The accessory lung lobe will sit in here, okay? and um, I know this is not the accessory lung lobe because the accessory lung lobe would kind of sit in here, but this area kind of caught his attention. There's a caudal ventral mediastinal reflection that is this normal little band right here. And this dog's caudal and ventral mediastinum is chock full of fat. And so the combination of fat, the expiratory bump of the cupula of the diaphragm, and sort of the apex of the heart sitting here, it's just allowed a little bit of overlap in that area and you don't get the normal interposed gas to create that margin, okay? So um, it's good to be to be aware of this because you can see accessory lung lobe pneumonia. I've seen, you know, uh, skewers, barbecue skewers go from the stomach through the liver into the accessory lung lobe and it just creates this nice little uh, pus pocket. So, um, but that's the caudal ventral mediastinal reflection. Normal, it's got fat in it, normal. The reason that I know that there's nothing in the accessory lung lobe, not the greatest case because of the dog's fat, okay, but this is the accessory, uh, this is the caudal vena cava right here. And this is the caudal vena cava right, right here. The caudal vena cava has a plica vena cava and it's surrounded by the accessory lung lobe. And the accessory lung lobe has gas and the caudal vena cava is fluid. So you should be able to see the differential attenuation. If you take the accessory lung lobe and you fill it with blood, pus, uh, fluid or a tumor, then you're going to face the gas and then you'll lose that ability to see the caudal vena cava. So I, again, differential attenuation, Rentgen signs, they're helpful because you just go, well, that, that shouldn't look like that. CTs, we're not doing CTs. Oh boy. Maybe I've already done this one. I don't know. I hope not. It's a coughing um, jack. Uh, it's a coughing brachycephalic dog. He's uh, he's old. He's like nine or ten, and he's coughing. And then he's presented with an acute worsening of the cough. We got a right lateral view, a left lateral view, and a VD view. I apologize for those of you if you've already seen this case. I think it's really lovely. Um, I'll make sure to to watch it. So. Uh, older dog coughing, worsening, it's acutely worse. And now he's presented to your clinic, 7 p.m. on a Friday. The owner is very annoyed that they've had to wait for 20 minutes. But they have nationwide insurance. So they've allowed you to take these $600 radiographs. Oh, Steve, sharp man. I love it. Cranial margin of the left cranial lung lobe appears to extend on the thoracic inlet and you are right it does appear to do that i, I agree man what's the pericardial lipoma i get an impression i can see the heart through the pericardium yeah man that's probably fat well fleshed little little uh, little dog i'll show you a case of that in a second okay so the trach is compressed ventilate with the thoracic inlet it appears to taper at the crina, but only on the lateral. So something transient concerning these times. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. Anybody else? You guys are, this is good. I like it. So let's pull up the two views and just show you. By the way, I, uh, maybe I should, I should do this is put up a little quick video about what I use to, to look at the radiographs. Okay, but I use Horus, I'm on an iMac, iMac Studio. The only reason I'm on a Mac is because it had this nice combination of size of the monitor. I'm on a 27 inch, but I don't think that you need to do that. 21 inch iMac would be great, but I'm on Horus, it's free, and it allows you to window and level and, and do this sort of thing. So I think comparing these views, is great, right? Because you've got the trachea, and boy, that looks pretty good. The trachea, I would describe this trachea on the left lateral view as normal, and then I would describe this trachea as ab, well, I would describe the intrathoracic trachea as narrowed, right? So this 
what's happened is this still has a fairly normal diameter, but it's kinked. So this dynamic change is the result of this, the following sequence of events, okay? The principal bronchi, the carina, totally gone, right? So that is where the right cranial lobar bronchus, well, that's where the right cranial lobar bronchus pops off. So this area is the carina and the principal bronchi, people call them the main stem bronchi. So this area right here should be like this, should be nice and gas filled. Look at it here, it's just a mess. You can't see it, you can't see it because it's collapsed. And it's collapsed dynamically as, as Amelia said. So the dynamic change is quite interesting, right? The static collapse, while not definitive, you could be worried something was pushing it. But the fact that it pops back open on the left lateral view compared to the right, you gotta go, oh, wait a minute. If there's something compressing the trachea from above, like a peripheral nerve sheath tumor, a paraspinal tumor, esophageal foreign body, esophageal mass, something up there smashing it shut, it usually wouldn't be so dramatically different on the left lateral view. So that's the first thing. Second thing is when you collapse the trachea, the intrathoracic trachea and the principal bronchi on an expiratory radiograph, which is expiratory on both, but apparently based on the, the pathophysiology, he's more expiratory on the right lateral view. When this is collapsed, you will herniate those cranial lung lobes through the thoracic inlet. So look at this one. This is the left cranial lung lobe, just going. Okay, so that's no, more normal. Here's the left cranial lung lobe herniating through the thoracic inlet. The right is poofing out through the, the thoracic inlet, poofing with an F. And then here is just this vague opacity right here. That's the lung. So this thing, intrathoracic collapse, the dog either coughs and or is expiratory and he pushes and he can't get that air out. So it just goes boom, straight down into the lung lobes and those things go cruising through the thoracic inlet. Okay, so this is, this is this is diagnostic, unless somebody wants to tell me otherwise, this is diagnostic for collapse of the principal bronchi, like crina area. And uh, I, I think the degree of narrowing of the intrathoracic trachea is also concerning. And at least when I was in, in, uh, in training, you really needed to, to be aware of the bronchial component because of the inability to stent those. I think somebody recently tried it or whatever, but uh, I don't know. So uh, you can stent the trachea, but those bronchi are, are, are not. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when you have an expiratory radiograph, I, I cannot, this next point I think is so critical. So when you look at this radiograph, you should say to yourself, holy smokes, there's something up here. He's got edema, there's a lung pattern. And then over here, you think maybe there's still a lung pattern, but it's less. So when you inspire, you bring in the black gas. When you bring in the black gas, you contrast that with the whiteness of the pulmonary parenchyma, you know, the interstitium, the blood vessels, the airways, the normal things. And you also contrast that with the abnormal things like uh, nodules, masses, uh, and, and edema, okay? And so you want as much blackness in those lungs as you can get. Well, when you've smashed the airway shut and you've blown out a ton of the gas, you're already in trouble. So you're losing the blackness. Everything's going to look more white. So it's going to freak you out that you got edema. So in these respiratory cases where you need to decide, is this a non-cardiogenic? Dog's got collapse. We got chondromalacia. Okay, check. So that's a chronic thing. And maybe it's worsened acutely. And we need to give them some acepromazine or torb or fluids or, you know, put them in oxygen or relax or whatever. But do we have another problem? Like he's got a upper airway, uh, an obstruction. I think they call it pope, post-obstruction pulmonary edema. So he gets non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from this upper airway. He's not, um, help me out. That's kind of upper. You know, my guess is LARPAR will cause it. Choking will cause it. Stay tuned. I don't know. We'll edit this part out uh, or, or we'll modify it. I, I think you should be able to get non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from something like this. I don't see why not. Um, the view I would do is I get a DV radiograph put that dog on his sternum. And what the reason is, is because that caudal dorsal lung is, you have the best opportunity of having an inflated caudal dorsal lung when the animal's on the sternal. You put them on their back like this, that lung's on the table, all these organs smash on it, it's just gonna collapse and you lose the air. And then you're sort of, you're sort of back to square one. So Dr. Allen says the trach is collapsed. I would use the term, the, the, uh, is compressed. I would use the term collapse. Um, and I think we worked through that collapse versus compressed. Compressed tells me somebody's pushing on it. Collapse is maybe a loss of integrity. I, I think I think this will trouble people. I mean, this is you know this will this looks a little 
a little unstructured interstitial. So if you, you know, start slugging the dog with Lasix, um, you know, and, and there's this, not to mention there's this left auricular bulge right here. Uh, there's the left atrial enlargement right here. There's increased opacity right here. You know, so the dog's got, uh, this is him on another day. I think that's him on another day. Yeah. So there's left sided, uh, left sided cardiomegaly. It's mild. There's tracheal collapse. You're probably going to sculpt a murmur. This cardiac waste is flat right here. This is interesting right here. I've just pulled up another study. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not convinced, but I, I think this is, this is the reason that, that I'm hemming and hawing about this is then you go, well, is this a, is this sort of like low grade edema from either his cardiac disease, non-obstructive or his non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from, from his tracheal issue, or is it just the lack of air? Cause he's, he's blown it all out. And, and it's so subtle that I'm not convinced that it's pathology in the sense of fluid. And, I think what you could do before the animal leaves your clinic is you could drop a DV view um, and, and go from there. And that's why I'm a huge proponent of charging the clients, the unsuspecting uh, clients for a, a, don't charge them per radiograph, charge them per site. Like do, do just do the test, get the test. You know, I mean, the fact that they've got a Doberman, not their fault. Oh boy, I love this one. Okay, here we go. Acute vomiting. It's a cat and he's young. Okay. We've got uh we've got um I'm glad you like the case, Steve. Steve Steve shows up a lot, so I know Steve likes rads, which is cool. Let me uh let me do this. Here we go. We've got okay. I think I'm I'm Doing really well on incriminating patient and client information. This is December of last year, so recent. Young cat vomiting. Got three rads, okay, of the abdomen. Uh, I can show you the, well, I don't think the, whatever. I don't want to give anything away. I'm going to be quiet. Let's go for it. Okay. Anybody uh, want to take a crack? And then I can tell you kind of what I think is uh, my, I can, I can, kind of walk you through how I work through this case. Okay, kidneys are prominent, possible form, body in the duodenum. Easy there. You ray, stomach distended, mix of soft tissue, fluid opacity, left lateral fundus has gas, which is good. Yeah, so Doc Allen's talking about comparing lateral views. This is a good, I think this is a good one. Let's see. You got uh, right lateral view. Yeah, so for all of you that read the book and you're like me and you're like, what in the world is left and is right? And so, uh, you know, left lateral view, the dog, the cat, first of all, it's a cat, okay? It's a cat because it's got these long lumbar vertebrae and it's a young cat and we know it's a young cat because the capital femoral physis are open, these greater trochanter physis are open and then you've got a bit of a physeal blush on the uh, lumbar vertebrae. So young cat, young cats do dumb stuff. Okay, acute vomiting. Uh, we feel good with the history of acute because this colon has nice, well formed feces. Um, when you look at the stomach, just to make sure we're all looking at the same thing, this is the stomach. Okay, so this ovoid structure, mostly fluid, some gas, and then you look at the left lateral view, and it's this structure kind of right through here. And then when you're on the VD view, it is this whole structure right through there when you see a stomach that has this much fluid in the cat you need to really really pump the brakes and uh, ensure that you're not missing anything and certainly due diligence to follow up you know ideally with imaging to make sure you're not going to miss anything when you put the cat with their left side down the fundus is a left sided as a left sided position and so Oh boy, sorry. Let's get where's the triple. Okay, so left side of the cat goes down on the table like this, right? So all the fluid rushes this way. And then as a result, the pylorus, which is now kind of right here, doesn't have any fluid. The fluid's down in the body and and uh, in the fundic area, right? So you get this gas-filled pylorus, which is what you want. Then you 
put the cat on the right side and all this fluid goes boop down here, right? And so then the pyloric and body, which is now down here, fills up with fluid. And you got a gas gap that zips up in the fundus, which is now over here, okay? So, um, so you've got gas. The stomach I would describe as moderately distended with a combination of fluid and gas. The pylorus is gas descent on the left lateral view, which is normal, okay? Uh, the kidneys, young cats. So this is the cranial pull. The cat doesn't have three kidneys, right? These are superimposed. So here's, here's one kidney, the right, and here's the left kidney. And then the so-called third kidney is where they're superimposed. Now, I think these kidneys are normal. Cats that are young have nice, robust, healthy, hydrated kidneys. Intact cats have nice, chunky kidneys. Um, so I think these kidneys are normal. The thing that you would pay attention to that has been giving me fits, and I hope somebody writes a report on it, but you got these bands right through here, these little undulating soft tissue bands. And I feel like I'm seeing them now all the time in cats. I don't see them there. And so I've been making some shit up. I've been saying that I think these are like fascial planes because in some instances they cruise cranial to the kidney. And I'm like, well, those aren't the blood vessels. Um, so I think in sometimes it's probably normal ureters, these fascial planes and these fat, you know, chunky little lovey love bug cats, or, or it could be hydro ureter. Um, but they've been giving me fits. I, I'm not that concerned about these. I don't know. This one seems to go cranial. I think I can follow it all the way here. And it's even cranial to the, you know, the, the, the hilum is in the middle of that organ. So if you're talking the hilum of the right kidney, it's probably right here. This thing's cranial. I don't know. I don't buy it. Okay. But Dr. Ure, Doc Ure from Croatia is, is just right on point. So check this out. Okay. One of the things that you notice is that the stomach has too much fluid, right? And then the other thing, hopefully, that you'll notice is that these small intestine, I would describe them as being normal in size, comma, course, and content. They all look the same size, and they all look empty, and they have a normal course. I don't see plication. They're kind of in the caudal, the middle, the cranial, caudal, middle, cranial. You flip the cat over. You got a little bit cheating over here. You got some little squirrelies down here. They're up here. So they're, they're all just very nice and gentle, and they're in their area. So they're totally totally empty. But now you got all this fluid. So now you got to look for a plumbing problem that's upstream. And if you look at the pylorus, you go, that's got gas and that's okay. All right. And then if you look at the colon, colon comes through here and it kind of dips down like this. But this structure right here is a duodenal foreign body. This thing right here is a radiolucent duodenal foreign body. Okay. It's right here. It's right here. This is a great view because those lateral views, you get all freaked out and wigged. It's colon. Is this colon? Where's colon? There's a ton of, it's the perfect size. It's colon. You're like, this is colon. My eyes didn't even look at that. But this one, you got to be careful because you go, here's ICJ, ileocolic, ileocolic junction. That whole thing over here pops up, whips around, tra ascending, transverse, descending. And then you go, well, what is that? That's next to the colon. Okay. So game over. Take this cat and cut it. I don't think you can get in there with an endoscope. So get in there, cut it. Oh, you know what? Don't cut it. Maybe milk that thing back into the stomach. I don't know. Do a gastrotomy. I'm not a surgeon. Thank goodness. Anything? Anybody got anything? Do you give treatment recommendations in your report? I do not. I've been encouraged to be careful with recommendations of any sort, because if the requesting doc doesn't mention that to the owner, whether they don't believe in it, or they forget or whatever combination happens and they don't they they don't uh give up that information to the client there have been cases uh where the client gets hold of the report and then they get upset because they want to know why they die so you create these headaches for your colleagues and, and they don't they don't like they frown upon that and so um as a consequence i will not often use, I mean, I will say in a GDV case, the dog needs surgery. I'll say in an obstructed, you know, small intestinal mechanical obstruction, this dog needs surgery, you know, but I, I'm very careful about being forceful with those recommendations. And I put a lot of the onus back on the requesting clinician for that reason, not because I want to 
you know, skimp on, on the recommendations. It's because we've been encouraged not to. So this is a, this dog is limping. He's a four year old limping dog. Okay. What do you got? Anything normal limping? You gotta be careful, right? You want, I'm not going to try to dissuade you that, that this animal has pathology, but I, you have to be careful. Sometimes the study doesn't have the answer. Well, it's a patellar fat pad. Natalia, yeah, that's right. Doc Thomas. So we don't, you know, not not that this is uh not that this is a knock on on you. Um I'm so glad you already said that. Because I'm so glad he said that. Um so the loss of patellar fat pad, joint effusion. Yeah, I, I feel like you say that you know people know what you mean and i think the, the, the that's really all that language is, is is just trying to communicate things so what i say is it effaces the fat pad because we see on cross-sectional imaging it doesn't compress some people say it compresses the fluid is not compressing it uh it's not lost like it didn't you know you're not like looking for it sort of thing so i'll say that there's you know within the cranial aspect of the right stifle joint there's or Increased soft tissue opacity partially effaces the right infrapatellic fat pad. So I put the anatomy at the end, just like I told you not to do, uh, but, you know, whatever. So increased soft tissue opacity partially effaces the infrapatellic fat pad. There's an extensor fossa that you sometimes can see that's pretty robust in some animals, but not in this particular dog that sits about right here. That's sort of the cranial border. Uh, we've talked about this on several of the previous episodes, but that's sort of the cranial extent to which anything caudal to that that's opaque i think it could be fair game for it to be a, a meniscus the menisci uh anything cranial i start to get kind of kind of interested uh that it's a joint effusion um but one of the things that this dog has is he's got cranial drawer so these femoral condyles look if you drop the line straight down from the condyles So this thing is uh, is in cranial drawer, okay? So you can say unequivocally that this animal, at a minimum, has a complete rupture of its cranial cruciate ligament, okay? That, that should be more, they'll use the intercondylar eminences as sort of a ballpark for where these condyles should be. That's the fibular head, but the intercondylar eminences should be right in here, and those should be closer, okay? So this, there's increased soft tissue opacity that partially effaces the right infrapatellar fat pad and the right tibias and cranial drawer. This asymmetry, so Yuri was talking about there's a medial fabella of the gastrocnemius and a lateral. And boy, they're in a different room. But that can be, a, a especially when it's the medial one is more distal. I feel like it was in fox terriers. But that asymmetry can be, can be an incidental finding. Um, and the way that you would confirm that is you would palpate this medial head of the gastroc, make sure it's not on fire. And then you would compare the, uh, typically these are bi bilateral. So you could, you could, uh, you could spend the owner's hard earned cash and take a radiograph of the other, of the other limb. Um, but the easier thing to do is to not do that and to just palpate that area, but those tend to be bilateral. Uh, here's the popliteal sesamoid right there. I can't really see it on the lateral view, but it's this little nugget right here. So you got one, one, two, three, and then here's the fourth sesamoid. Cool case. Um, I think it was fox terriers. There was a breed that had these the asymmetry and it tended to be Asymmetric. Okay, let's do one more case. 17 people are still here. Okay, this isn't going to a case that we're going to do. I just want to show you something. I feel like when you don't do it, you don't learn as much, but I, I don't really want to go through the rigmarole. So this is an example of not only the contribution of body fat, but check this thing out, dude. Okay, so this view is total chaos. You're going to get the loop diuretic. And then you just take a little better breath. Okay. So these, if you can see the timestamps over to the left, 158 p.m., 159 p.m. 
So this is just a difference in, in, in the respirations. So this isn't like they gave Lasix and then it was the, you know, the next day. It's the same dog. Um, he's just taking a little bit of breath of breath. He pulled in that blackness and he pushed it all out. That's probably a nipple. Okay. What's that? Yeah. Ooh, that's right. That's so nice. Okay. And then you kind of look back here and there's nothing. So um, the whole thing is just you got to be aware that there are limitations of the study. The differential attenuation is critical. This is a great example of uh, just took a little bit better breath on the right, pulled in a little more gas, along a little more radiolucent. Oh, great example. Okay. This is a normal meniscus. Let's just check this thing out. Look at that. Okay. Boop, boop. Normal meniscus right here. A little bit of opacity right there. Normal fat pad. Okay, cool. Check. Roger done did that. All right. Let's call it quits. And then I'm going to answer Graham's question. With the normal menisci you just showed us, can you put those lines down from the condyles for the cranial drawer check? The cranial drawer check, um, what I what I would do for the cranial drawer check is a couple of things. I would flex the uh, tarsus, right, to try to put it in drawer while you take in the lateral view. But you have to also consider that if it's a chronic thing and it's fibrous down and you got this thick, nasty joint capsule, it may not move. So for me, the cranial drawer is one of those things where you, you if you catch it, you go, oh, this is nice. Uh, but you don't always catch it for those reasons mentioned. So I like to um, have those condyles be, be very close to um, the intercondylar eminences. And uh, the intercondylar eminences are those two little nuggets that sit like sort of in the mid to caudal aspect of the tibia. And those things need to be just next time you start looking at your stifle rads, look at the rads, look closely at the rads and look at the proximity of those condyles to the, to the tibial plateau even. And a lot of chondrodystrophics, it gets kind of wonky and there's a, there's a little bit of variation, but for your standard like Labrador, I mean, they should be pretty close to each other in the cranial caudal plane. And so once you look at that over and over and over and over again, you kind of go, oh, wow, th those are pretty close. Now, again, flex the tarsus, get that lateral view. And in some cases, especially with an acute one where the owner brought them in, that thing will push forward and you'll catch it. Um, so I don't know if that helps. All right, guys. Talk to you next time. Bye.